All right, what else are we forgetting? Check. We got the mics. It's recording. That one is. That one is. We got the cameras recording. We got the lights on. We got the card in the audio. We're finally all set up. It's about damn time. Only took me four or five tries. There's plants in my face. You're really in the jungle out there. (laughs) This place needs more plants. It would be funny if, uh, like, maybe in these podcasts, we never saw your face. It was just like a plant in front of your face. (laughs) Kind of like Wilson from Home Improvement. Unknown person. The editor could do that. Editor has a lot of power. (laughs) Blur me out. Sounds like more work on my plate. (laughs) I don't know if I like that. I'm just going to assume everything's working. Not 100%, but we're going to roll with it. So, today is March... 2nd, 2023, last year, on March 1st, 2022, we signed a two-year lease in this office building, but uh, I just wanted to get our thoughts on uh, what it's been like being in here for a year, and, uh, you know, what maybe something we learned, hopefully we learned something. I'll tell you what terrifies me is when we when I signed the office space lease, the realtor or the broker, whoever the fuck I worked with was like, yeah, at a year and a half. So the way, the way this lease contract works is we signed it for two years. And then at the end of the second year, we have basically we have a player option for three more years. So it's not one year. It's not like we can sign on for another year. You choose yes or no to another three years of the contract. Has to be three years. It's a three year player option. It's like a franchise tag. It's, I mean, that's it's, way it's more than a franchise, franchise tag. It's a dynasty tag, yeah. basically, at that point. And the guy was like, after a year and a half, you have to decide if you're going to stay in the place, pretty much. Because, like, Damn. with five months left, you know, the moving process... Remember when we first got in here, it took us, like... It took us a few months to, like, really get settled in. Yeah, it took a long-ass time. Yeah, because we... I mean, uh, albeit we have most of the furniture and the stuff that we would need for a new place if we were to move. But, like, it takes you a minute to move. It takes you a minute to, like, settle in. It also takes you a little while to, like find a new place if you're going to move, you know? So it's like, you have to kind of decide that up front, which means if what he was saying was serious and he's like, after a year and a half, you had to decide whether or not you want to hit, hit that option. That's six months from now. It's coming up. I would have to decide if we want the space for the next three years. I'm like, I'm not ready to make that fucking decision right now. I think I'll be a lot more knowledgeable about the decision in six months, you know, when it's like September. So. That's like peak fantasy football season. At that yeah. Point and I'll have an, which is not good. It's not a good time for me, you know when people are like, don't make decisions when you're emotional? Yeah. That part of the year is always like a riding high part of the year because we're like, we're in it, right? We're making content every day. Like numbers are growing. Subscribers are growing. We're making a lot of money. And I'm like, yeah, let's fucking, you know, let's let's go. So it's not a good, I wish I had to make that decision like three weeks ago. It would yeah. be fucking turned uh, you down. You would not say, be ready to make that decision. I'm never ready to make that decision. Well, That's what would true. you That's do if you had to make the decision right now? If I had to give an answer today, uh, I would give a no. And then I would look at other office spaces. Really? Yeah. I'm not, we're not ready to sign a three-year lease somewhere. I'm not ready to sign a three-year lease right now. Three years is too much. If it was a one-year option, I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. We can sign this up for another year. But to commit for three, we didn't even commit originally to two years. You know what I mean? Let alone we have to, we have to more than, we have the 150, 250%, whatever the fucking math adds up to be for the next three years. I'm not, I I think it's stupid. I think we could find... Another place that's probably maybe a little bit smaller, which is probably would be fine for us that we can get a one year or two year or a three year contract that we wanted on for probably less money. So it was like I was forced into choosing. I I love this place. I think this is like an awesome fucking spot. And I'd like to say here, but deciding on three years right now when I still feel like there's a little bit of uncertainty about like the size of our team, what we're going to look like over the next three years is like. I think it's a little a little too intense. Yeah, that's fair. I wouldn't say it needs to be this big. Like, I no. think we've got more than enough space for sure. Yeah. Downsides would make sense. There's like three fucking areas of this office I feel like we could do without. Yeah. Like the entire, when you walk in place, yeah. doesn't need to be there. Like that living room area. If we get, if we have more people in the office, like we almost might need to flip that into another desk. Like we almost might need to like duplicate this area over there again. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know. There's, uh, there's different variables to it. I, I agree. This place is, we don't need it to be this big. I think it's nice to have the space, but like, yeah, you know, in case one of us needs to live here, <laughs> exactly, it's might good. happen. Yeah, <laughs> might happen. Um, that was a crazier thing that happened this year. You yeah. came from Canada around what month was that? Was that like June? Like end of April. End of April. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It was, it was right, right at, at the, the end draft. Of draft. Right. You showed up to America, and day one of you being here was like, I'm gonna go watch the draft with yeah. BDG, basically, yeah. right? It was literally it was Tuesday that I arrived, and the draft started Thursday. What did you do for those first two days? 
Well, here? I moved into Tony's place. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how long were you at Tony's place for? It was like a month, a month, and then he moved out because I had somebody else taking that room for two months. And then you moved yeah. into the office. Yeah. yeah. So I lived in the office for like two months. Honestly, not that bad. Lived with it. <laughs> what was the worst part about being here? Like, what were some things that you're like, dude, thank God I'm not living in the office because of this? Uh, Probably like not really having a bathroom. There was no shower. I'd have to, I'd like, I would wash my, I would brush my teeth from the kitchen. You showered when you left Tony's apartment and then when you moved into your new, yeah. when you went back to his yeah, apartment. Yeah, so two months without showering. Yeah. Stunk pretty bad. It's crazy. <laughs> I knew I smelled something weird here in the office sometimes. <laughs> Also having an air mattress, it's it's <laughs> all right. Like it was probably one of the better air mattresses I've ever had. I'm not gonna lie, there were there was a multitude of times where I was on like hotels.com and I was like thinking about just ripping you a hotel for like a week and being <laughs> like, go get a good night's sleep. But then <laughs> I went to check out and it was like thirteen hundred dollars. Like yeah, wow, no, I don't really no, like don't you. Do it. <laughs> it's just one week with no I sleep. I would never even want you to do that, but like spend the money somewhere else. Yeah, I just I felt bad. Like the the air mattress thing is was just insane. Like, ah, the fact that you don't get fresh air in here is like crazy. I don't need fresh air. I, uh, it's overrated. You're built different, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you're young. You're younger. Yeah, I don't know if I would have even been able to do it when I was your age. Really? No, nah, I would have been fine. I could have done it for like a year, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you knew it was short term too. Yeah. Like in yeah. the back of the mind, you're like almost over. Wait, hold on. What, what was the timeline? You moved here into Tony's place, then moved into here. After three months, you moved back into Tony's, or not? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, I was supposed to move in. To some other place, like I was supposed to find somewhere to live. You had a then, friend who yeah. had a friend. Yeah, you had yeah. some connection and then that, that friend I was... turned out to be not so fucking friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was gonna live in like Brooklyn or something yeah, for okay, a I couple remember. months. Chris was telling me that he offered you his apartment for like a week when he was on vacation. Yeah, and it's like I don't want to go there for a week. What's the point? What do you mean? <laughs> I don't want to just carry my somewhere shit for a week. Just carry my shit there for one shit. You had one suitcase, a duffel of bag of fucking nine t-shirts. Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> ah, too much work. That's crazy. One thirty-minute subway ride and you're good for a week. That's. That's your yeah. commute now. Yeah. But the commute was sick, though. Just get out of my bedroom, <laughs> yeah. walk 20 steps, and I'm at work. If you could walk negative steps, that's what you would take to get yeah. to work. I always felt bad because I got here, like, super early in the morning, and I felt like I woke you up. I love that. I love when I'm <laughs> <laughs> walking and she's sleeping. <laughs> I don't know why. There's something about it that I was like, this is so pure. This is so amazing. <laughs> it's just funny because, like, no other workplace will ever have that happen. Well, it's probably not legal. Yeah. And we, I feel it 100% like wasn't. What would you say, like, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but, like, number of legal and illegal things that we've done in this office over the last year? More than your average company that's only that's been alive for, like, it. a year. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's all fucking you-related coming from yeah. Canada. Yeah. The amount of crimes we're committing to have you here. Inter we're committing international fraud. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this better be recording. What Does it say recording? Yeah, it says recording. See, this is some nonsense. Like, we can't even figure out if we're recording on a goddamn camera right now. Lighting's terrible. Look outside. I don't know where she yet. No, no, no. Just fucking pan it. Just follow my fingers. I'm going to direct you. From there? Bro, look at the screen. I can't. <laughs> I can't see. No, the mic's fucking dead. Tony, you are out of control right now. All right. So starting from there, this is a movie set right now. All the way through over there and down there. This is all the equipment they bring to like a Hollywood movie set. I just saw Queen Latifah down here somewhere. I don't know where she went. I promise she's there though. And we can't figure out whether or not we're recording. We can't get one mic right. We can't get the lighting right on ISO. And it makes you think, man, this movie set just knew how to tweet. They'd probably be a lot more successful. Where are you, Queen? She was right here. Dude, I'm telling you, some of the setups are insane. They usually have like 40 trucks going. Yeah, because they shoot one, one scene and it probably takes them like six hours. It's so expensive. Yo, I wonder what they're filming. We gotta know what movie this is. I mean, if Queen Latifah's in it, it's fucking terrible, probably. Sex, you saw, you saw catering down there? Yeah. What do they got? It's kind of hard to tell. I can tell, see there's like apples and pears and shit. It's not really catering, that's just like a snack basket. Yeah. Anyways, we can go with this camera and tell them we're part of the crew and that we uh, we're entitled to food. They're literally filming right below us. BG, or, gonna make it in the in the movie. We're gonna be famous. Like this is so extra. There's gotta be at least like fucking. If there's fifty, there's probably seventy people out here. At least fifty of them don't need to be here. 
There's six guys that think they're directors. We were just sitting there doing nothing. I know. It's how it's, it's like fucking BDG. <laughs> it's like us every day. Yeah. This is just us at scale. If we ever took investment money, we would just look like that. Still doing nothing. Damn, they're not even, even letting cars go by. There's like taxis and shit just stuck over there. That loud? No, probably not. Actually, probably. They probably have to get licenses to film here. I feel like a fucking nerd. Like, why the fuck do I care that they're out here? They should be fucking filming us. They should turn all, point all the cameras to our window, for being honest. Film us filming them. Yeah, have a fucking battle. See whose vlog gets more fucking views. I mean, they got Queen Latifah. Yeah, no, we're fucked. But we got Sexy P. I might, we're just gonna, you, we're just gonna put Queen Latifah as the thumbnail. Queen Latifah's gonna be in our movie. <laughs> we hired Queen Latifah. Five running backs this season that are Queen Latifah. <laughs> Let me put you on some queen shit right here. Oh, the fucking plant is getting focused on. Now we good. Got her. Queen spotted. The goat. All right, let's do a, a fucking scene or something. Let's go. You need me to get down there? They probably need extras. Action. Quiet on the set. This year sucked, bro. This year just sucks <laughs> in general. This year sucked. <laughs> No, I like, I mean, I talked about it in the vlog that I put out last week. It was just, there was just so many learning points. There's so many parts of what I'm doing now is, as like your guys' boss that I, I had never, ever done before. And I thought it was going to be a seamless, like, it's fine. You know, they've worked, they've done stuff for me. They've worked for me, but it's very different in person. And I've never held like a manager job in a corporate setting before. I've always been entry level or the next level up in a corporate setting and I've never actually had to like lead or manage people. And not that I, I think I have a uh, trouble like leading people, but I think my type of leadership is not. It's very hands off. Yeah. yeah. It's not like corporate. It's not like the way the corporate leadership typically works, you know? And that was and it's something I realized quickly, like I'm going to need to develop those skills if I want to like work with four, six, 10 people in a physical space, you know? So it was, it was learning. And I, I mean, I do look at it like of all the, shitty stuff I and we have gone through this year, it gives me a sense of strength that like I didn't have beforehand. There's just a lot of things that I'm like, oh wow, I learned a lot from that. And there's a lot of, the large majority, the, mar the large population has not gone through the similar events and circumstances. And you're like, that's good. Because when we need to use that stuff again, it's like there are, we don't need to turn anywhere. It's just like, it's on us and we know how to deal with it. You know, so there's, there's a good and bad to it. I feel like we've gone through the bad parts already. So a lot of, a lot of the good, I feel like is still left to be accomplished. I think we could uh, experience more bad. You want to experience more bad? <laughs> we, can, some bad. we can go deeper into the bad. I, I know it's like going to continue coming, which is yeah. like the shitty part about it, but I don't know. No, I, I agree with, you, with what uh, you're saying, though. Yeah, it's like the more bad that happens, like the more, I don't want to say like used to it you get, but you you, you have like a, an acute sense of awareness that you're like, oh, I'm in I'm in the bad right now and there will be good afterward. It's almost like, a, <laughs> like the first time I took mushrooms, I like tripped my face <laughs> off, right? And, yeah. and I was young, I was in college and I was like, when you're in it, when you're like having a really like high, when you're hallucinating, you can't pull yourself out of it and be like, oh, I'm just high right now. But I took mushrooms like eight months ago, I think. And I got really high and I was like, oh, like you're fine. You know what I mean? Like you're on yeah. drugs right now. You're hallucinating. You could just like step back and be like, damn, I'm kind of going through it right now. But in an hour, this will all be done. Right. You know, that's kind of the way I look at life now where it's like I'm going through something really shitty and it sucks that we have to go through this. But it's also going to be a, a learning curve for me. It's also going to be something that I can like step out of and be like, it's probably not that serious, you know? Yeah. One thing that just popped in my mind being a big event here was the Big Dog Bash. Uh, obviously, we all put a lot of work into that. We were, you know, spending a lot of time focusing on that. But then when it like really came around to it, there were two events that like stand out in my mind. One was all the reports, all the reports coming out about it. It basically felt like, I made this comparison at the time, and I'll say it again. It felt like we were the Seattle Seahawks. We just traded away Russell Wilson, and we're just facing all types of backlash for it. And nobody under really understood exactly what we were trying to do. And we had, like, this vision. It was like, no, guys, Geno Smith, <laughs> he's yeah, yeah. good. Like, trust us. Yeah. And we're like, we got these picks and whatever. And people were just like, you fucking idiots. You guys are running some... Clown show shit over there, getting rid of Russell Wilson, doing this NFT project, yada, yada, yada. But it was 
an absolute roller coaster. It was a roller coaster, but it was a vent. We were listening to this Twitter space going on. We were blasting it on the loudspeakers. We were all kind of like, it was, it was so weird. Well, it was I've like never th- they like the two events were like, okay, you have that that article that drops about us that causes like pandemonium and kind of like. And the reason that it feels like it was so significant is because we had so much momentum. Yeah. We dropped it and it was received so positively by a large scale of people, right? It yeah. was like, it was not a typical thing that you see in our space every day. It's like, okay, here's like a product or here's a piece of content and here's whatever. It's like, this was a, br- a brand new thing we were bringing to the space. And it was like, yo, this is dope. Like the video came out so well and it was so well received. And then, you know, there needed to be another shoe dropping somewhere. So it was like, that hits and it's like, kind of takes the wind out of us. Like, yeah, maybe there's some things that we didn't really consider within the launch of this. And then that Twitter space happened. That's when I felt like we were listening to, to Sports Talk Radio. Right, exactly. That's what it felt like. <laughs> it felt like like Colin Cowherd was about to jump on that Twitter space and be like, yo, BDGE yeah. and Nick Ercolano, <laughs> la, 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 la. But like... That was crazy. It yeah. was crazy. There was a point where we thought we weren't going to do the bash at all. Yeah, there were many points throughout that like two week process because we were on the phones with like fucking lawyers like every day. It was weird because you get on the you get on the fo- uh, the phone with anyone who's not technically a lawyer who's not like legally a lawyer, and they're like, "You're literally fine. We've done things that are five times the size, five times more X Y Z. There is not as there is a less than point one percent chance that you ever get in trouble for this." Yeah. You got on a phone with a lawyer, and they're like, "We want a ten thousand dollar retainer fee, and this is a really bad idea if you do this." And I'm like, man, which one sounds more like human? Like, which one is 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 more like real when it comes to the way we should act upon this? So it was like, you're getting on calls with all the people that are like telling you you shouldn't do it. And they're legally probably correct, you know, because, because it's unknown. Like the NFT yeah. space has no real boundaries to it. And they're like, what if in five years they make this law and then they backtrack? It's like, as a lawyer, I get it. Like as a lawyer, you can't, tell somebody that something is legal or illegal without actually knowing the answer to that. But when everybody else, and we, I mean, we were on calls with like, obviously like Scott Fish runs Scott Fishbowl, but he's also like the head of legal for some of these sites that take buy-ins, which is not like a, a small thing. There are not a lot of people that actually are knowledgeable about that space anywhere in the world. Also on the call with like the president of legal affairs for companies that we've worked with, whether it was like FanDuel, DraftKings, Underdog, like those types of people that know what the fuck they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And I trust them because I've I've met them in in person. I know what kind of people they are. So it's hard to like pick and choose. It's, it's, it's like, it's something we're passionate about and everyone's telling you that you're probably going to be fine. You're going to be okay. But because there is a group of people that are telling you, no, this might be illegal, like, what if something yeah. did happen, and then you look back and be like, I was told that this was going to happen. Then I'm a clown. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. then you're then you're a fucking certified clown. But um, we had to go back to the drawing board, yeah. And it was just like, I don't know if I wanted to, I don't know if I wanted to risk the the clown label five years down the road. And that was, I guess, where the kind of conundrum came into play. I think, I think what was, like, nerve-wracking about it was the idea behind it was we wanted to promote it so heavily. And we wanted to yeah. document everything about it. And that was like a double-edged sword. It's like, we could do that and make the project the best we want to do. But if we do that, we're also yelling about the project into the abyss that might not be a legal thing. Yeah. And that's where I think really took the wind out of it. Cause it's like, how do you move forward where no matter what action you choose, there's a negative side to it, you know? And that's like where it became difficult. But looking back, we probably should just went fucking full steam ahead yeah. from the rip. There never should have probably. been a problem, I don't think. No. If if that article never dropped, we probably wouldn't have ever even thought about... We wouldn't have thought twice no. about yeah. it, no. And then nothing would have happened because nobody cares. Which could be like a learning lesson because anytime we want to... That's what I'm saying. I'm looking back. It's like, sure, like maybe we fucked up by not just pushing full steam ahead. But the next time, over the next five years, I'm sure we'll try to drop some kind of project that we want to do at scale. And we'll be a lot more thorough with the way we go about it this time. Yeah. But had yeah. that article never dropped, if we never talked to lawyers and never gone through that process, I wouldn't think about that probably the next time we drop a project. You know, I wouldn't think about the legal side. I wouldn't think like, oh, we're this big. Like we really need to cover our asses with everything that we do, which is a significant part of probably what we need to be doing going forward with things. Yeah. It's a good learning lesson. And uh, so, yeah, that whole, the whole, uh, you know, sports talk radio moment, that was one that stood in the mind. And the other one was just simply draft day. When we were all ripping our own drafts, we had probably like a dozen people in here from all different leagues just going at the same time. We're all yelling at each other. And this was when... 
Brian Robinson <laughs> got shot. <laughs> got shot in the middle of our, everyone's the bash because all the bash drafts went off at the exact same time. Yeah, it was like and, six p.m. Eastern time on that Sunday. It was probably like round twelve in a lot of people's drafts. Right when like you're thinking about Antonio Gibson, maybe you reach on round, Brian Robinson. It was round seven. I took Gibson in round seven because of the B Rob news. Yeah, yeah I had Gibson. And I, the the best part though was one chain misreporting it to everyone, <laughs> saying that Allen Robinson got <laughs> shot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we want to get into it, but like bash twenty twenty three. Um, what are we thinking? Well, I have I have. A few thoughts, I guess, about it. And uh, okay, so one of the one of the learnings I took away from the bash was that like something at that scale, right? Like you have a customer base of six hundred people that all paid significant money to get into it, you know, give or take whatever. And it's a project that you know it's not just like a, we drop it, it happened. They we ship out a product and like they're off to live their life. It's it's something that we need to be on top of literally year round if yeah. we want to make this like a credible good project. I'm like, we need someone to focus on this almost full time. We need someone who's like the product manager or the president of the fucking BDG3 project. And like, we don't have that in the office right now. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm comfortable running it back, knowing that I know that now. And then being like, let's just try it again anyways. And giving 60% of our effort, you know, because there's a lot of me that felt like, I don't know if I want to say we gave 60% of our effort, but like in terms of results of where I wanted the project to be, I feel like it came out to like 40%, right? But it was, I mean, I get, we tried our best. Like I tried my best, I feel like within the grand scheme of, of the project, but we just had so much other like things going on at, at the time, like so much content to be made, so much content to be edited, other projects that we were trying to do. Like there was just so much going on that I realized it's not something we can just throw to the wayside and be like, Let's dedicate an hour a week to like what's going on here. It's like, no, someone yeah. needs to be dedicating the 30 yeah. hours a week, to like making sure this shit runs smoothly, creative content, prizes. How do we keep people engaged? You know, how the technical stuff, like yeah. I need someone else working with the Web3 agency. I need someone else planning the content for this. I need someone else coming out with like the prize structure. I need someone else dealing with the financials of this stuff. Yeah. Even like 60% of it took up way more space than we could even imagine it would. Right. And we even like, we're cutting shit out. Like we cut out the draft weekend. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. Like exactly. We like, like we put this ahead of other things that were like key to our brand. Like our energy might have gone, it might have gone further elsewhere. I don't want to say that because like, I think it's cool that we did the fucking project and we actually like pulled it off in year one. But there definitely needs to be more focus on it if we want to run it back, which is why I'm like, okay, part of me feels as if, uh, you know, we, we obviously cut it down from three years to one year, which yeah. was like the best decision we made with the project pretty much given the momentum that we had at the time. So we don't like, we don't necessarily have to do a year two. Th there's part of me that's like, I want to take this year as a regroup year, get our foundation back as a business, like slowly grow. Just like I said, great content, great products, documenting, like want to make sure that that's our foundation. So we set that up for six months a year. And then we feel comfortable as a business being able to scale correctly this time. But there's part of me that's like, man, I feel like I'm letting down the people who own a BG three pass. If we just don't do it in year two, they didn't buy a year two pass, so they would still need to go through the minting process. I don't think we have the resources to go through the entire minting process again. I don't think we have the people in place. I don't think we have the infrastructure. I don't think we have the focus right now. So there's part of me that's like, okay, how do I, how do we walk the line between not letting the people that invested into the project year one down and still being able to have our focus in the right place? My first thought is like, why don't we why don't we do like a an actual why don't we run the big dog bash, but actually have it as a free to play tournament? We can keep all the other incentives that people who own the v1 of bdg3 like coming to the office if we do in real life events whatever those are the people that are allowed to come so basically that extends more than a year that'll send into year two but you don't have to remit anything you just you own a v1 pass like you're good to keep using that for whatever we end up dropping for that and then we run back the tournament on sleeper right 600 people whatever but we make it free to buy in so if you have the v1 you're good to go again so it's it's more value but we take money out of our pocket which i think is like for me it's worth it it's it's almost worth it for the peace of mind to make me feel to make us feel better about like if we feel like we're letting down the people that bought the v1 have like a $20,000 grand prize right just straight out of our pocket right um and i feel like if you bought in for v1 right like you got what you were expecting in year 1 Year two, we give you another free to play tournament and we put whatever 20K towards it. If we want to spread that out, it's like first, second, you know, league winners all, all get 100 bucks or some shit like that. However, we want to do it, right? Like just putting some goodwill towards the tournament. So it's like you can't really complain in that way, right? I'm not looking for like people not to complain, but I just want to make sure they feel like we're continuing to give value yeah. into the second year. 
I don't know. There's part of me that I feel like, oh, there's people in here that almost do deserve a year two or would be the most disappointed towards it. And it's like, do we take some money and, and because we want to do the draft weekend again this year, the New York City draft weekend, do we reserve like two or three spots for those people and we like pay their trip? Is that, am I getting like too fucking emotional and human with that? I'm like, we're running a business here. Like we did what we were set out to year one. Like this is it. Sorry, we're not in the right place right now to do year two. We're going to do our best to be back in year three. Or does like, playing the humane level side of things, like doing the goodwill side of things, which is how I feel like we've always operated as a business. So it's probably the right way to go. My, my gut tells me that's the right way to go. But like, I'm also interested in hearing like what you guys think about it from a more, I don't know, outsider perspective I, in a sense. I think I agree with you that like, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that were in the bash this first year and they're, they'd be very disappointed if it didn't happen again. There's pro- I'd say probably 50 people, I think at least in of the 600 would be like very disappointed if it didn't happen. If if we just say, like, we're not going to do the bash anymore, it would be a very big letdown to them. But at the same time, like, it is, I think especially with, like, the whole NFT part of it, it just, like, adds, like, this whole other dynamic. If we have to, like, remint it and redo everything, yeah. it becomes something that I feel like is too much for us right now. But at the end of the day, it's like, people can, people, I don't know if people would be disappointed that the bash, the tournament doesn't happen but they'll be like, I bought into the first NFT yeah. of BG3. So I think as long as we continue to deliver value for the people that own the first iteration of this, I think there's easily amends to be made. And that's the other thing that makes it, even even if we do a free-to-play tournament, that's still going to end up being a lot of work. Because yeah. I still don't want to yeah, like would... just drop it and then forget about it for the year and come back six months later. Like I still want to have content around. I still want to have a focus on it. I still want to like make it a thing. And the other thing is like communicating with the 600 people. That number is going to dip down from... 600 people to probably like 350. The way social communication works nowadays, like in order for your audience to hear the thing that you have to say, the announcement that you have to make, just communicating in general, that number will dip from 600 to 370 to 320 to 260 or whatever. And we'll have to like manually make sure that we have the the perfect number of leagues. Like what if it's 264 and that's not a number divisible by 12? It's all these things that still come up that we'll still have to you know, focus on. Um, I mean, listen, there were people last year that literally bought BG3 passes and didn't show up to the league and didn't even know like when the draft was happening. Yeah. Because yeah. they, you just, you need to be reminded 55 times on social media in order to like remember something, even if you pay $300 for a pass. So like the fact that people don't care about it anymore, people stop caring about it in like week four of last year. Yeah. But I think they still care a year later, like just not, it's not how it works. So what do you think of the idea of like getting someone on it full time but still doing kind of like a, let's call it like a soft year two, where it's not like the full reminting, it's not like as big cash prize. Is that like still worth it? Or or do you think it's like... I think if at the end of year two, we sat down with however many BDG3 version one pass holders we could sit down with, and the end of that conversation ended with them being like, I'm ha- I'm extremely happy with my purchase. I feel like I got value from the purchase I made with the BDG three pass. That's all I need to hear. You're that, talking that, about like, if like you said at the end of year two, at the end of year two, if the people who, if we don't, I, I think you I think would, if we cut it off now and we had that conversation with those people, they would be like dissatisfied. I don't think we'd get anyone that's dissatisfied, but I don't think we'd get, gen, I don't know if I think if we ask for genuine excitement out of people, I don't know what percentage of people with the bass pass would have been genuinely excited. Maybe 10%. I don't know. Maybe that number's not even that high. Like maybe 50 people, maybe 60 people. But if at the end of year two, we continue to deliver value and we make it better based on the things that we've learned in year one, I think we could up that number pretty significantly. And we also like start to zone in on the people that care the most about the project. So if at the end of year two, if we did not remint, and at the end of year two, we sat down with everybody that originally minted that owns a pass and they were like, I'm, re- I'm, I'm, I'm happy I purchased this. That is a success in my eyes and nothing more. Do you think this is something that like we can even bring up with, people in the bash like just what do you guys want to see moving forward that's like the smartest shit anyone said within the last 34 minutes it's something i don't <laughs> do often enough it's something that i don't like talk to our customers often enough to hear what they want but yeah we should 100 percent do that judge sexual patterson how are judge. the courts today courts are great <laughs> 50 minute court today <laughs> how many convicts did you uh send to prison just one just one sounds like you weren't doing shit today <laughs> Yeah, I haven't done shit today yet. You're over here making TikToks? Yeah, trying to condense 50 minutes down to three. <laughs> it's pretty easy. <laughs> a lot of shit that's useless. <laughs> that's all I'm doing. Justice was served today. Hell yeah. I'm out here watching fucking A.T. Perry. 
versus army tape. Did you see that fucking schnag? Yeah, let's check it out. See, most, most morons will tell you it's a great play. I'll tell you, his route, fucking rounded as shit. Check that out. It's more like an ice cream scoop. He ain't doing shit there. D-back, some army scrub. Probably got fucking, what's, uh, what's the name for when you get like unenlisted? Uh, dishonorable discharge. They probably dishonorably discharged him at halftime for that fucking D-back play right there. Like that dude probably runs a 5-2. People on Twitter will tell you otherwise though. That's just not impressive to me. I've actually never been impressed with anything in my whole life. Rookie season's upon us. We're, we're now shifting into that mode. Uh, talking about the youngins coming to the NFL. It, it feels like that's got you in a good mood. feels like that's got you uh, hyped up. Because, you know, at the end of the regular season, you can get a little mundane doing the same thing over again, doing the waivers, doing the doing the rankings, the weekly rankings. So now it's uh now it's now it's something fresh at least. Like I'm sure I'm sure the rookies get tired once we get to like the draft. Maybe uh, maybe not the draft. Well, it's an like, easy switch up. Yeah, you do this for like two months. At the end of April, it's May, and then you have May and June can kind of be a. It's almost like um, I don't know. You can do whatever you want there. Realistically, like you could still talk about rookies. You can go straight into dynasty. You can do a mix up of of those three. But like once you get into Kind of like July, August, you're, you know, you're worth straight redraft pretty yeah. much yeah. at that point. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's always been this way. It's just more flexibility. But this year I plan to like, I think it just outsource the content much, uh, much more efficiently to where, you know, and it's like in season is so it's, it's half of it's tough because like, I can't get to all the content I want to do half of it's like, I don't want to do all that content, but that's, that's the part of me that's like that kind of pulls me down. It's like, I can get to the waivers. I could, I could do the Monday stream. I can get to the waivers, but it's like knowing that I'm not going to have the content for Wednesday is just as shitty of a feeling as not actually doing the content itself. You know, being like, man, there's like, these people want this content. I'm not gonna be able to put it out for Wednesday. Yeah. I, I think I'd just be like, it, it would be much easier for me during the season. If I'm like, okay, I know I got to do Monday, Tuesday videos. I got someone that's going to crush Wednesday, Thursday videos. And then I can get back on like Saturday. Like if I know my schedule rather than being like, I'm going through the week, doing some random shit, feeling shitty about not doing everything. You know what I mean? Like that's, I think, where my mindset kind of goes downward because we don't have the pieces in place for that particularly. <laughs>